Hey guys, welcome back. So today we're gonna to talk about low carb versus low fat and review the longest and largest ever low carb versus low fat diet study published to date. This 20 week study over 160 participants and we're gonna catch up with the author, the lead author, Dr. David Ludwig. And the main finding was that at the same body weight, the participants on the low carb, 20% carb diet had a faster metabolic rate. They were burning 200 to 250 calories a day more using a method called doubly labeled water or stable isotopes. That's considered the gold standard. The paper right here, we're, we're going to break it down. So at the Metabolic Health Summit, I had the great fortune of catching up with Dr. David Ludwig. And although we'll cut to some footage very soon, the full uh, Facebook Live, if you will, is over on the Metabolic Health Summit page, which is an awesome event. If you didn't attend, you gotta put it on your calendar for next year because the folks over there, particularly Victoria Field and Angela Poff and Dom D'Agostino and many other people, they put on this amazing event. And it's, it's a, not only good for networking, for learning, for community, it's great. So let's cut to Dr. Ludwig and learn a little bit more about who would most likely benefit from going on a low carbohydrate diet. One aspect about your, your study that you recently published, and I'll link below, friends, was this subgroup that may be particularly, that may benefit particularly well um, from a low carbohydrate diet was folks with high insulin levels. Do you want to speak to that? Sure. Well, what the study aimed to do is examine whether the type of calories you consume affect the number of calories you burn. And so we first brought people's weight down by, we had 164 participants, we brought their weight down by about 10 or 12 percent. So for a typical person that in our study that would be 20, 25 pounds, that's going to put the body under some metabolic stress. We know that after weight loss, metabolism slows down and the body is primed to regain the weight. So that's the purpose of that initial run-in phase. Then we randomly assigned our participants to low, medium, or high carb diets. So 20, 40, or 60% carbohydrate. And we did one more thing. We kept their weight the same by adjusting their calories that we gave them uh, to maintain weight stability over five months. So during, this was a feeding study where we had very close control over what people were eating. Uh, we actually fed them 160,000 meals as part of this very wow. large study. Um, and the main finding was that at the same body weight, the participants on the low carb, 20% carb diet had a faster metabolic rate. They were burning 200 to 250 calories a day more using a method called doubly labeled water or stable isotopes. That's considered the gold standard. But we're all, not the, we're all not alike, and we also saw that there was a group of people who were especially sensitive to the amount of carbohydrate they're getting. These are uh, called the people with high insulin secretion. We measure that with an oral glucose tolerance test, looking at insulin 30 minutes after the oral glucose. So the people who were primed to make a lot of insulin at that 30 minute time point, mm -hmm. well these are the people who are presumably going to have a lot more trouble if they're eating a lot of carbohydrate because you know that carbohydrate produces the most demand for the most insulin. And so that's what we saw. That among that group, the high insulin secretors, the effect of diet was especially large, over 400 calories a day. Whereas for the low insulin secretors, there wasn't much of an effect at all, meaning that if you happen to be a low insulin secretor, uh, a low or a high carbohydrate diet isn't going to affect your metabolism very much. This is consistent with a number of other studies. Uh, it doesn't mean that eating a lot of processed carbohydrates is going to be good for your cardiovascular diabetes risk factors, but in terms of metabolism, uh, one size clearly doesn't fit all. And this might help explain some of the variability between studies. If one investigator happens to get more low insulin secretors and another gets more high insulin secretors, well, they might be looking at different parts of the elephant, so to speak. So we need an integrated view, and that's one of the advantages of a study as large as ours. This is one of the largest feeding studies of this topic ever done. And longest um, term, right? Longest duration? That's right. So we five months of the, the test diets, 164, and that contrasts to many of the, most of the studies that have been done to date, which might you know, be lucky to have a dozen or two participants studied for just a few days or a few weeks. We know that metabolism doesn't adapt 
to a low carbohydrate diet that quickly. Mm -hmm. So that was the neat reason for doing a longer term study. There's always the uh, you know the tendency to want short term results to interpret short term results to understanding long term effects, but um, we do that you know uh, with uh, you know great risk to be misinterpreting uh, the data. Amazing point. You know, one thing that you you hit on there was this adaptive thermogenesis. You talked about it in the paper. When people lose weight, their resting metabolic rate decreases. Do you want to speak to that and maybe that there might be different outcomes in, in so-called adaptive thermogenesis in like a high carb, low calorie diet versus a you know low carb, low calorie type diet? Right. Well, according to the model we're investigating called the carbohydrate insulin model of obesity. The problem isn't so much overeating as a primary cause of obesity. We look at the other side of the equation. And uh, so this model says that overeating doesn't cause obesity over the long term. It's the process, the body's process of getting fat that drives overeating. Now that might sound a little surprising, but think of what happens in pregnancy. We know that the mother, pregnant mother, eats a lot. Um, she's very hungry, consumes hundreds of calories more, and the fetus is growing rapidly. But which is, which is uh, the source of this? Is, does the mother eating those extra calories make the fetus grow? Or does the growing fetus sucking up those calories cause the mother to be hungry and, or, and eat more? And we know that it, it is the latter. So why couldn't that be the case in obesity? If we had fat cells that were triggered to take in too many calories, triggered by all of the processed carbohydrates in our environment that raise insulin, other environmental factors. Those fat cells take in too many calories, there aren't enough for the rest of the body, and that's why we get hungry. And if we ignore that hunger, which is very difficult for most people to do, but even if you could, the body would fight back in other ways, most specifically with lowering metabolic weight. So in effect, when people who are, have obesity go on a low calorie diet, their body goes into starvation mode long before their weight goal is anywhere in sight. They may still have 50 excess pounds of fat in the body, but the brain isn't seeing that. The brain is registering starvation. If this is the case, if the carbohydrate insulin model is right, then we need to address obesity differently. We need to target the metabolic defect in the fat cells specifically by lowering insulin levels, helping fat cells open up, release those calories. And when that happens, according to this theory, the body is flooded with calories that had been previously stored. The brain perceives that as a better metabolic state. There's more calories available. We're less hungry, which is commonly reported on low-cal diets, low-carbohydrate diets. And with regard to our study, Metabolic rate doesn't have to drop as much. Since the brain doesn't think the body is in a starvation mode, uh, metabolic rate can remain higher, which of course will help you feel good, help you be more physically active, want to get off the couch and work out, and support the likelihood that you'll keep those calories calorie, those pounds off over the long term. So isn't that interesting? It makes sense so in hindsight, when individuals before the diet, if they have an exaggerated insulin response, it would make sense that they would most likely benefit from a low carb, high fat style diet. If you Monday morning quarterback the situation, it's like, oh, duh. But a lot of us don't really think about that. And I think that's important. You know, when we hear people say they went on a keto diet and they experience all this mental clarity, this mental elation, they have more energy and all that. And other people say, well, I went keto, but I didn't really notice anything. I think that could be part of the, the issue there is maybe potentially there's some brain hypometabolism. They're having issues potentially with insulin glucose regulation. And so those individuals, when they go keto, they really notice a lot of benefits. Whereas if individuals are pretty metabolically flexible, metabolically healthy, they've been eating low carb paleo and doing athletic work and they go keto and they don't notice much, potentially that, that means to me, and, and this study helps us understand that, that maybe they didn't have an insulin issue beforehand. So not to say that they shouldn't be low carb or they wouldn't benefit from keto through all the different pleiotropic and other benefits from epigenetics and the NLRP3 inflammasome and the other signaling properties that keto offers. But it makes sense then that uh, individuals that have insulin issues to begin with would most benefit from a low carb, high fat style diet. Now, another piece of the paper that I found that really interesting 
is how the ghrelin was most, ghrelin is a hunger hormone that drives appetite and satiety and so forth. And leptin, as you know, is a pleiotropic adipocytokine released from fat tissue that also plays roles in both the immune inflammatory response and appetite and satiety. And we'll cut to David Ludwig in a second, but he talks about how there is a difference in the ghrelin and leptin reduction in individuals on a low carb diet versus a low fat diet. So let's hear that from Dr. Ludwig. What we did look at was leptin and ghrelin. And so ghrelin is the hunger hormone, uh, which is made in the stomach that makes you hungry, but it also has metabolic effects. It's fairly clear, at least in animals, that high leptin not only causes you to eat more, but shifts your metabolism to fat storage. You know, that's a fine thing to have to help you save, store calories, get, get through the winter, um, if there is gonna be, you know, a famine coming. But that's not the state you wanna be in if you're trying to lose weight. And so we found that the low carb diet lowered leptin more. That's gonna be advantageous, again, for hunger control, possibly metabolically. We also found some evidence that leptin sensitivity improved on the low carbohydrate diet, but that's going to require more investigation. More deeper testing and everything like that? Yeah, we're, we have other ongoing analyses of these data to look at other hormones. We want to look at the thyroid axis because oh, wow. we know thyroid is going to affect metabolism. Mm -hmm. um, what's happening to the stress hormones, uh, the reproductive hormones. You know, when the body, one of the things that we know happens especially to women's bodies when they're calorie deprived, is that they shut down reproductive access. So women with anorexia. In obesity, women, um, especially if there's insulin resistance, can have a variety of other kinds of disordered reproductive issues, polycystic ovarian syndrome. So uh, we're going to be interested to see how these reproductive hormones change both in women and in men. Amazing. So you have the, the blood that still from the, those groups or you get we attack do. them yeah, yeah, okay. we've got lots of lots so can of do samples. A lot of analysis. We've got fat cell biopsies. Isn't that interesting how when you switch your macronutrients over a long period of time, what you see is changes in hormones that regulate appetite and satiety. So super interesting stuff. Now there's one last part of this conversation that I thought you might enjoy, and that's an upcoming study that we're gonna learn a little bit more about. I shouldn't say a study, it's an upcoming and deeper analysis of this particular study that Dr. Ludwig et al. will be sharing with us. And that is how dietary saturated fat, when there's an absence or a dearth of carbohydrates in the diet, that would be a low carb, high fat style diet, a ketogenic style diet, how that may change our perception of cardiovascular disease risk. So we know that when you combine fats with carbohydrates, we heard from Ted Naiman and other, many other interviews like Dave Feldman and so forth on this channel, that's a recipe for a disaster. But when you take away the carbohydrates and then potentially that insulin response, that may affect this, the oxidation or the metabolism of saturated fat. Actually, I'm not really at liberty to talk about the results, but we have some fascinating new data on cardiovascular disease risk factors that are gonna um, perhaps uh, help us uh, uh, examine some current recommendations as they relate to high intakes of saturated fat. Oh, goodness. Um, you know, Exciting. so there's no question that a lot of saturated, in my mind, that a high saturated fat on a high carbohydrate diet is not a good combination. Bread and butter yeah. do not, you know, that's not good for your heart. But the question is, if you reduce carbohydrate a lot, get rid of the processed carbohydrates, lower insulin, does saturated fat still have the same adverse effects, or does that saturated fat get oxidized much more quickly and not really cause much of a problem. So we're gonna be able to address that question in more detail. Well friends, that's it for today. Now, if you wanna watch the full interview with Dr. David Ludwig and I over on Facebook, it's linked below here, and definitely put the Metabolic Health Summit on your to-do list, on your calendar. It, it occurs in January every year now, so definitely check that out. And last but not least, the study that I'm referencing below is linked below. <laughs> the study that I'm referencing below, the study that we talked about today is linked below. Definitely check it out because there's controversy about this. You know, there's people like Kevin Hall, there's people like Lane Norton that are critiquing the study methodology and the calorie expenditure methodology, saying the doubly labeled water is insufficient and so forth. And I think as a ketogenic diet advocate or someone that's curious about metabolic health and metab metabolic regulation, you should be aware of this. And uh, j just, you know, then you can track and follow what people are saying on both sides of the story. I think it's good to have an open mind about these conversations. And I've been following Dr. Ludwig's research for a long time. 
Um, I, I think he's you know a, got a great head on his shoulders. He seems re relatively unbiased. And you know these these pay, these studies that he's doing. There's multiple people that, as you heard, they serve these individuals 160,000 meals over the course of 20 weeks. So these are big trials, and I, I like that because some of the short-term metabolic ward studies are just that they're short-term. So how can we make global inferences from short-term studies when we know that these adaptations take a long time, right? Anyway, I think it's interesting. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please hit that like button. You can always share this with a friend or family member, coworker, colleague that may benefit, and we'll catch you in the next video. Peace.